Just before midday, a 7.8 magnitude earthquake devastated large parts of the Himalayan nation. This was the worst earthquake to hit the region in over 80 years, ultimately killing more than 8,000 people, injuring more than 18,000 and displacing thousands more. Three days later, volunteers with South African humanitarian aid organization Gift to the Givers are packed and ready, heading towards the airport. Two teams consisting of search and rescue, medical specialists and media are flying to Kathmandu, the capital of Nepal, to assist in relief efforts. The first team flies out that day. As we fly into the capital, the damage and displacement becomes obviously clear. Orange tents can be seen from the sky, propped up everywhere in open fields, as people either have no homes left or are too scared to return to theirs, fearing they will collapse. As we arrive at the airport, it becomes clear that several other international teams have been waiting there for some time, and we soon find out why. Most of the search and rescue team's equipment stayed behind in Singapore because the wait could not be accommodated on the flight. This is a common problem for international teams, with many arriving in the capital only to find out that the bulk of their equipment is still stuck on airports all over the world. Within a few minutes of arriving at the Little Angels School, locals started asking their South African team for help, either medical help or help in finding lost loved ones, or just assistance in locating the body of a family member. Despite not having all of their protective gear, a small group went out to what used to be a six-story apartment building with 50 rooms. The team used a camera to look for signs of life under the collapsed building, calling out as they went about their work. Up to a day before, calls of help could be heard coming from the rubble, but now these calls were silent. The team confirms that they can smell what they believe is a body, but they can't get in deep enough to find it. They mark the building so that the military can come and remove the man's body inside. The wife of the man believed to have died inside is informed, but she, like so many others, maintains that she wants to see the body before she can truly find closure. Over the next few days in the capital and surrounding areas, the true devastation and chaos caused by this massive earthquake and the consequent aftershocks became evident. Those buildings that were left standing were pressed up against each other at unimaginable angles, many appearing to shrink by several stories as they fell in on themselves. People were relying on food and water handouts, sleeping outside in what has become tent cities, and those lucky enough to still have houses left were sleeping on the ground floor, too scared to go upstairs. In some cases, the traumatic effects of the earthquake could even be seen on the animals. Dogs were cowering underneath the rubble, too scared to come out and too scared to allow anyone near enough to help. Within a few days, communities were already starting to clear away rubble, salvaging what they could and trying to rebuild. And yet the smell of death still hung in the air, forcing many, including small children, to wear masks in an effort to block out the smell. Not only were the houses and businesses damaged, but temples and religious artifacts too. Something many explained went hand in hand with the Nepali culture and would be difficult to restore to its former glory. We saw firsthand the damage done to the Swayambhunath temple, better known as the Monkey Temple to tourists. It's the most important Buddhist shrine in the capital and was founded 2,000 years ago. This man has been working and living at the temple for over 20 years. He explains that he wasn't home on the day the earthquake hit, but his wife and child were. I was not at that time here, but my family was here, everything was here, and those all, all my families are here. This place, it was a really beautiful place. It is now nothing, nothing. Scores of cremations took place at the Pashupatinath temple on the banks of the Bagmati River. This is one of the most sacred Hindu temples, the oldest in Kathmandu, and also a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It is common practice for people to be cremated here, so not all the dead were linked to the earthquake. 
it remained an emotional scene as friends and family bid farewell to loved ones. We were told by mourners that as part of the ritual, the fire has to be started at the mouth, and elements such as earth, air and water played a vital role in assisting the person into the afterlife. Gift of the Givers founder Imtia Suleiman explained that for this mission, they compiled the largest team in the organization's history so far. In the week Gift of the Givers was on the ground in Nepal, they worked in several local hospitals, doing 164 surgeries and conducting over 700 primary health care consultations. The devastating earthquake has not only left its mark on locals, but also had an effect on volunteers. Marcus says that despite these sacrifices, he was more than willing to put the lives and needs of others before his own and would do so again in a heartbeat. I did it for my country, first of all, and then I did it for gift of the givers, and then I did it for humanity. And I feel that to, to find inner peace, I have done sufficiently what I can for the Nepalese people. And if one get called again or being... Uh, called up for another thing like this, I wouldn't hesitate.